thought there wouldn't be a movie then. Hello, me. Oh. Hello. You shouldn't look so scared. I'm probably the only one who wouldn't hit ya. Though I have to say, seeing others do it does annoy me greatly. I've managed to open a pinprick in the walls between our realities to let you know this, me. All of you white-faced motherfuckers through there, I'm gonna come and I'm gonna royally fuck your shit up. Not immediately. Probably next season, but I will. Oh yeah? You in what army? You've never seen my show, have you? Look me up. Ah, oh, shit, the signal's fading! <sighs> Listen to me, I promise I'm gonna help you. I fucking promise! Well, she seemed nice. <laughs> Shut up, you. I have a demon to hog to look up. Listen me, I promise I'm gonna help you. I fucking promise! And it's gone, mistress. I had 30 minutes set aside for that dramatic confrontation. Well, hopefully that scared them enough. Oh, it did. How long to leave a proper doorway? It'll take a long time. Then get on it! <sighs> what to do now? Mistress, I suggest you review Alan Quartermain and the Lost City of Gold, as if you previously reviewed King Solomon's Mines. That'll really confuse the viewers. Great idea! When in doubt, review something. And if you can confuse people at the same time, even better. Greetings, gentle viewers! They made two Alan Quartermain movies in the 80s back to back, and although much of the same people worked on both, one is much worse than the other. This one's shit! Of course, it might have had something to do with the way they divided up the budget. Maybe. I mean, when you hear good background music in this film, the chances are it's some of the first film's score cannibalized. If the music's bad, then it's probably original music written for this one by a guy much cheaper and less talented than Jerry Goldsmith. It starts about a year after the events of King Solomon's Mines. Sharon Stone and Alan Quartermain have bought themselves a massive house and lands, complete with their own pet tribe. Oh! Who are forced to watch as Quartermain mocks them by destroying good food food that he likely had to import because tomatoes are not from Africa. You know, Quartermain's kind of a dick. <laughs> Maybe if we all laugh, he'll stop us starving to death. <laughs> How did they get this tribe? Did they go around collecting shirtless boys and hope their families would come too? Still, at least Sharon Stone's there to meet a train. Truly, this is the best place to put your thrilling recycled adventure music. Spelar jag det matt, rör du mig. Being white and pre-basic instinct, she's allowed to grab anything she likes from the train. Luckily for everyone else, she only takes her own package. She's a benevolent dictator. Today. Meanwhile, this guy's being chased by some ominous looking feet through what's supposed to be a jungle, but really looks like someone's garden. So, what did Sharon Stone pick up from the train? The suit. Right, a suit. You hate it, don't you? Oh, but I could learn to. Dick. The guy being chased is disheveled, exhausted, and possibly wounded. But the guys chasing him are fine. More than fine, actually. They're members of the African KKK. The African KKK are weird. 
First they burn a massive Adrinka symbol outside your house, and then they put you in blackface, so everything's really fucked up. Back at the house, Sharon Stone's forced Quartermain to cosplay as the gay 11th Doctor, ready for their trip back to America. And he wants to gauge his harem's reaction to it. Okay, boys, how do I look? That's it! That clinches it! Come on! Apes. Monty Python, the flying circus! He was running through someone's garden! Anyway, gun or no gun, Quartermain chases after the African KKK, and I'm wondering how exactly they managed to chase the guy down while keeping their loincloths and masks so sparklingly white. I mean, not even the real KKK could manage that, and they have the advantage of not being fictional. Anyway, the African KKK get away, but Quartermain destroys his suit. One objective successfully completed. I'm fine, thanks. Dick! The disheveled guy is one of Quartermain's friends who went off with his brother Robes and Quartermain at some point between Gah! My door! and the epic jungle walking shot in the previous film. Anyway, this bit part has realized that he mistimed his arrival and came too late to be in the good movie. No! No! Apparently this guy, Quartermain's brother and the rest of the team went off in search of a long lost white race who had incredible wealth and power. Because back in my Gwendolyn interview, when I said it was basically the same film as this, I wasn't fucking kidding. Just Gwendolyn's got more tits. So Quartermain managed to steal one of the African KKK's knives during the fight, and once Sharon Stone dons her brainy specs, she's suddenly an actual archaeologist. The inscription here, it... it looks Phoenician. This knife... What do you think? Sun symbol is definitely Egyptian. Phoenician and Egyptian, truly two of the whitest races known to man. And Quartermain, for a guy who spends a lot of his time killing violent people with equally violent friends, and the rest of his time enslaving children and generally being a dick, apparently couldn't conceive of someone attacking his house, because it has no guards, and none of the doors are locked. One thing's for sure, the fever didn't kill him. Oh well, they got all the info they needed out of him, and in the morning they're off to the local Middle Eastern slash African city that until recently was ruled by the Germans. And a local trader takes offense to Quartman refusing to buy shit off him. Come on, trader, business can't be that bad. Ah! Trader! Ah! Trader, I'll, uh, I'll buy it. I'll buy the pot. Trader! <laughs> what a wonderful fabric, eh, Quartman? Woven by the finest English craftsmen, it fits like the skin. Where'd you get it? From a Welshman pretending to be a Turk, he was badly charred and missing most of his flesh, and seemed to be powered only by anger directed at Wagner. But he told me to tell you that he's coming for you, Quartermain, as fast as his stumps will drag him. Is it just me or has the quality of the prop bullet professed gone down with the soundtrack? Sensing that'll be useful later on, Quartermain buys it, before visiting Swarma, a racist caricature playing a Ferengi. Have you ever seen one of these before? It is a coin. I really want to know how he's not set himself on fire yet. He's kind of flammable. Though he could just be really old and that's not a house. That's a birthday cake. Swarma's cowardly, opportunistic, is convinced that he's a holy man and interested only in gold. He's also supposed to be Indian. Did you tell my brother how to find this lost city? I told him what I knew. Find the wall of Jalpura. Pay heed to its secrets. Seek the devil's heart. I'm guessing the first three actors they cast were actually Indian, but were burned to death on set in tragic turban-related accidents. So they grabbed a sound guy, slathered him in paint, and gave him some towels to wear. So Quartermain decides to search for the lost city to try and find his brother, without telling Sharon Stone, who is meant to be marrying in America. I'm not going. Sharon Stone is awful in this, but... Oh, hell. My brother still may be out there. I've got to look for him. Out there. Somewhere. In Africa. It's really not that big a continent. I mean, that dying guy, without directions, found the house we moved into after he left. More impossible things have happened. Well, when do we think about us? We're talking about my brother and my best friends. What am I? Well, I'm fairly sure you're not my brother. Though, hypothetically, she could be... Nero? 
Explain. Well, Sharon Stone is Quatermain's love interest and not his brother. But his brother in this movie was played by Richard Chamberlain's real-life love interest, his husband, Martin Rabbit. The subtext of this movie just got really weird. Someone watch Basic Instinct to make sure that Sharon Stone isn't his brother. Mistress, I would remind you that a vagina proves nothing. So for happy moments, we get the possibility that we'll spend the rest of the film sans Sharon Stone. But we're not that lucky. The bastards dangle the possibility that she won't be in the rest of it. And going to America is what I have to do. And then, bam! She not only stays, but she does a striptease to fuck with you all. And by you all, I mean the audience in general. It was nice of them to get Alan Quartermain from the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen to cameo again, though. I figure you can choose between the Vamoosas, who'll rob you, the tomatoes, desert you, or the Mapaki, who'll eat you. <laughs> and with all these racist descriptions to choose from, they can't possibly fail. Anyway, Quartermain's native best friend in this movie is in Slabagos, played by James Earl Jones. The one and only part of this film which is better than its equivalent in the first one. Am I a stranger now? He yells a lot, has a huge fucking axe, speaks with a bizarre accent, and I'm fairly sure he threatens to eat shawarma at some point. <laughs> eat shawarma. In short, he is this film's John Reese davies He also brings this movie's nameless red shirts for the journey. But before the journey can begin, it's time for Sharon Stone to be sexually assaulted. I'm beginning to think it was in her contract for these movies. I mean, Richard Chamberlain wasn't going to fuck her. Maybe it was all the action she could get. Recognize that scream! That's a sign your relationship is on interesting ground. Why me? You're going to marry the guy. He has a first name. And you know, swinging a machete after James Earl Jones used his axe seems a little bit superfluous. <laughs> Tropical to desert to tropical to New Zealand. I have no idea where they're going, but they can't be going the most efficient way. How do I know it's New Zealand? Listen to the soundtrack. Take a wrong turn and it sounds like you'll end up in the city of goblins, not gold. But it is appropriate walking music. Wars of Jalpura. They swarm a nice work. For a while, I thought we'd end up in Cleveland. Since they found the walls of the made-up word, they're on the right track. But now they must face the trials of the labyrinth set. Wait. The guardians of Jalpora. Who, me? No, I'm just a worm. <laughs> It is the stirring of restless souls. Come inside, meet the missus. What purpose do these walls serve? To irritate people who think critically. I love how the storm only happened when they arrived in the corridor. Where are they, the Hyrule Royal Family tomb? And I don't care what sort of crazed, super white race of... white super Phoenicians you are, you don't build a hundred mile long corridor in the middle of the fucking jungle, okay? It's just silly. I mean, they live in the direction of one end of the corridor. They're not really helping with their, ooh, the location of our city is mysterious shit. Go. Go. A golden sun setting on a river. Did someone say go? Come inside and have a nice cup of tea. Maybe we follow the river to a golden sun. Or to a golden city. Ahem. A mysterious golden city that's lost, somehow. And it's nice you have traps designed to kill weirdly Indian Ferengi via earthquake machines when they try to steal your gold, but why have traps inside the corridor? That's where the travelers with brains will assume they are. The smart travelers will stay on the outside of the corridor. You put a trap there, they'll never expect it. Don't go that way! Never go that way! But I do like the four idiots reacting to the sudden earthquake by running forward into the corridor. I applaud anyone who assumes they can outrun a fissure. I think we're starting to piss off somebody's god. 
You certainly pissed off mine. Et nomine organis. It's Hudson! I'm not sure I want to know how you can tell. I'd recognize that bone structure anywhere, Sharon Stone! Quartermain saves the day, and they've only lost one nameless extra. There's a limit of one racist caricature for every peril. These travel shots are a lot like video game loading screens. Oh wow, they're sailing past a traditional African fog machine. And they're in luck! It's mating season! What's that? An Ashawi. Wardress. Yeah. Tabashima! Tabashima 4! That doesn't sound too friendly. It was friendly, all right. He wants you in exchange for using his river. A very progressive film series. They went from, hey, where are the white women at? To, hey, I want to own the white woman in not point six seconds. And is Sharon Stone the only woman in Africa? 90% of the men they come across want to own Fucker Eater. Or all of the above. So they won't part with Sharon Stone for some reason, and the Africans who own the river they're sailing on let them go, but swear that they'll get terrible revenge. Which involves turning into a SEAL Team 1920s African style. If they'd made another Quartermain movie, that guy was going to be revealed as Nslobogas' son. Oh well. They lost one of the three remaining idiots in the attack, so for those of you keeping score, we are two idiots away from the danger maybe affecting our heroes. Try putting it in the water! Sharon Stone, you don't get to look down on anyone else in this movie! They come across a small army of African guys in boats. Luckily, James Earl Jones has an axe-winging force field. Honestly, I have no idea what he's meant to be doing, or if it's working or not. For all I know, the tribesmen feel so bad for him, they're all deliberately missing. <laughs> Except for... that one guy. Me, so they think I'm a, a devil. Do I need to mention that Quartermain bought the Bulletproof Fest? No? Moving on. Like the movie. Do you think they've given up? For now, anyway. Depends on how long they're scared of the devil. I really don't know what happened there. One moment they're on a river, and the next the movie's turned into its own Universal Studios ride. It's amazingly realistic. It's like we're there in the log flume with them. I have died. Why did I not heed the legends about this rotten trip? Have I entered into the shadows with its pimpering wretch? I hate to disappoint you guys, but I think we're still alive. And we've lost another Ascari. What? Between shots? Here's an idea. How about you don't put all the red shirts in one boat? Or at least put the obviously fake Indian who nearly got you all killed and is obviously going to betray you on their boat. Just an idea. What are we, we going to do? Keep acting like we're in a cave. Duh. Well, they're obviously too late to do it now, but next time you pick up some red shirts, dilute them with the main characters. You might keep them alive a little longer. Mein Führer, I can fly! And not one shit was given. They escape from the fire when Quartman shot a massive outcropping of rock from the ceiling, which creates a mini tidal wave and pushes them away. A few seconds ago, the water was boiling. Luckily, no one can remember that far back. After a quick wander through a location from the killing of Satan, Sharon Stone ends up in a pit, while Swarm is attacked by drashic hand puppets. Trademark BBC. And Quartman recognizes yet another rotten corpse. Oh no. It's not your... No, no. It's Tremont. I think he's just making it up at this point. Hey, um, if those little monsters were dangerous, then why weren't there any bite marks on the dead guy? I mean, later on, they even come across a lion. Did no one think to eat this guy's corpse? African wildlife, I am disappointed in you. It's dead. Quick, everyone have sex just in case there's more of them. Quartermain's gun is amazing. It not only kills, but it replaces its victims with a completely different taxidermy version of themselves. The part of the made-up location was tonight played by the real-life Victoria Falls. 
This shot would look amazing with King Solomon's minds written across it. In fact... Look! The last city of Solomon exists! I've seen some amazing things in my life, but never anything compared with this. That matte painting is gorgeous! Not enough tits, though. So they made it to the city. Finally. And after saving someone from the exact same lion they just killed, and having it turned into the exact same taxidermy lion, they're allowed into the city. So, the city. The place is so white, I think they painted the walls using blonde people's heads. And I wish I remembered exactly what I meant when I wrote that line. There's a tractor with <laughs> I haven't met Swarma yet. This place is like the United Colors of Benetton advert, if the world had much less diversity. The city's main inhabitants, as in the ones the movie thinks are important, are white. The black inhabitants either say nothing or act as servants for the white ones. They find Quartermain's brother, who, because he's family, is allowed to use his first name exactly once. And if you notice any sexual tension between the two of them, please remember that these two men are still fucking today. <laughs> I told them you were my brother. Brother! Yes, climb the yellow brick staircase to your very African pineapples. In your city that has no trading links with anyone. So, how are you? And Dumont, how's he? I'm fine. He's dead. Glad you're okay. Anyway, even though there's two queens, the white one, Elvira, here playing not Elvira, and the other, even whiter one, they're both helpless under the power of evil Count Gene Simmons. The only man in the city pimp enough to wear a fucking colour. That's Galaska! Says you committed a sacrilege. But we just got here. Killed a lion, a sacred beast. Hardly. They killed two lions. Well, the same lion twice. What I love about this scene is everyone's total surprise that this city might in fact be evil. I mean, the only came on this journey because a guy who escaped from here was hunted to the edge of death and then murdered. In a way, Brian may want to sacrifice in payment for the life of the lion. Truly, the gods of rock are never satisfied. <laughs> There's about a million ways to die in Africa. Can't you please not just fucking pick one? Stick to it until it's a inevitable conclusion! Everyone decides the court means a god because he shoots a guy and survives the spear to the chest because of his magical bulletproof vest. And the bulletproof vest thing, that's fine. But Quartermain's brother's been here for so long that he's taught English to random characters important enough to have lines. He had to arrive with equipment. He never once explained how a gun worked. He wasn't asked what the purpose of his boomstick was. A miniature UN made up of magically non-interbreeding ethnic groups is one thing. But then thinking Quartermain's a god just because he can shoot people is fucking ridiculous. And I have to say, qualifications for godhood have really gone downhill since Jesus climbed Mount Olympus and guillotined Zeus in 1976. Oh. You know, out of experience, there are more efficient ways to create a giant novelty chess set. I mean, the guy will decompose in there, and if the gold doesn't crumble into itself, then eventually all the pawns will start rattling. And I fucking love Henry Silva as Egon the Evil Priest. He's this film's Raul Julia as M. Bison. I mean, just look at this. <laughs> Add that to the amusing clips archive. Consider it done. No, I'll consider it done when it's done. This was like paradise until Aegon showed up. He was a slave trader from the far north. A slave trader from the far north. They're in Central Africa, so far north could be anything from Egypt to Norway. And he's never come across guns before? Jeez, the stupid's being compounded so much we're gonna get idiocy inflation. And this film is somewhere around Weimar Republic levels already. Arifima. That means welcome in our language. Thank you, Majesty. Well, fuck you. That means fuck you in mine! You admire the gold statue? Ah. Quite a piece of art. Very realistic. Of course. He was a good guy. Now, a beautiful statue. Someone submerged in gold would not come out like that. The gold wouldn't cover them evenly. Much of the outer body would be totally destroyed. Honestly, I think they'd have better luck painting living people with molten gold which would still be stupid because, like I said earlier, they will eventually decompose. 
Also, where are they getting the gold? It doesn't just spontaneously appear in brick form. You gotta work to get gold. Anyway, fuck it. Here's Shwarma's big moment. Portal men bring evil here. So Ryzen is afraid that our sister's too weak to stop it. But if you teach us the secrets, we stop it. Secrets for me. Gold for you. Curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal. <laughs> ah, they have a whole slave army of black people to refine and whatever the gold. That's nice. You really like these people, don't you? Well, look around, Q. These people have lived together in peace for centuries. Where can you find this in the modern world? Cleveland? There you go. Robeson, why don't you leave this place with us? I'm in love with the people here. Those slave-driving, human-sacrificing people. Being a dick is clearly genetic. So the Dothraki, led by Carl Stupido, arrive to engage in a pissing contest with Quartermain. How does somebody find out they can do that? Was... Was the movie just funny? Rewind that, I need to check. How does somebody find out they can do that? Yes. Yes, it was. Um... Thank you, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Are you No, Nobody calls me. Abra Cadabra Abra Cadabra Abra Cadabra Abra Via James Earl Jones' axe, they destroyed the Altar of Sacrifice and put an end to the human sacrifice thing. Now, Henry Silva brought human sacrifice when he arrived. So how does a foreigner arrive and bring human sacrifice to a culture that didn't already have it? I mean, things seem to have been going okay here, then he suddenly arrives and tells everyone that if they kill their own people, things will continue to go pretty much okay. Wow. That's certainly a reason to kill people. Damn it. That music is just too triumphant. Say Tanarea. It means no more sacrifice. Tanarea! So, Swarma, Egon the Evil Priest, and the African KKK have teamed up with the random Mongol horde that took a wrong turn at Bucharest and the tribe from earlier. Movie? Although this applies even more to the first one, why are there millions of different African tribes with their excessive idiosyncrasies? That's not diversity. That's Pokemon. So... Yeah, these guys are the newly formed Pan-African Evil Unity Army. I'm seriously wondering if there's a scene missing. The last time we saw Henry Silva, he was in a huff because he destroyed his altar, and then BAM! He's left the city, become the head of the Evil UN, and the heroes are preparing for battle. I have no idea how they know the bad guys are invading, but they've clearly realized that we're nearing the end of the film. Where are the rest of the weapons? How are you looking at them? Brother, you better start thinking. Do you have any heavier metals? No, but we have gold. Well, with this much gold, we can make plenty of weapons. Not even the possibility of Quartman dressing up like Tom Cruise in Legend can placate me. Gold fucking weapons? That's like making weapons out of lead. Okay, they're not making weapons out of lead. I'm thankful for small mercies. Okay, you're making weapons out of gold. Why the fuck do you have time to make weapons out of gold? The baddies are pre-creating helms deep out there! If only Quartermain hadn't killed John Rhys Davies in the last movie. He'd come in really handy right about now. Look confident or these people will crack. Sure. So does my knee stop shaking. I mean, at least his one-liners would have been funny. Well, one of them might have been funny. 
but at least he could have been confused that James Earl Jones is basically playing Black Gimli. I welcome you! Who will first test the sweet gift of steel? There are few men who can believably yell over a thunderstorm, and James Earl Jones is at least two of them. They defend the city by dropping bricks on the invading army. How unexpectedly sensible, and wearing gold and bullet profess which deflect spears. So I'm suddenly not entirely sure the makers of this have ever come into contact with gold. The African tribesmen retreat because being hit by flying objects and surviving is the universal sign that someone's a god. This is one of the few parts of the film that's entirely accurate. Anyway, Chekhov's amazingly timely African tribesmen running away or not, the bad guys breach the walls and can only be stopped by one thing. A scene so epic that it can only be survived if you forget all you know about reality, science and pretty much everything else. Quartman gets a hold of Enslabagas' axe, raises it high while it's struck by lightning, and then smacks the golden dome of the temple with the electro-charged axe, melting the gold, which falls onto the enemy forces and hurts exactly none of the defenders. So how in the name of fuckery did he manage to do that? Simple, he really is a god. And cancer exists, so he's a dick. Oh, and don't feel bad about missing this, because I missed it and I've seen this at least five times. Sharon Stone really hates Elvira. I've got a score to settle with you. Why? You two haven't even exchanged words. I can be sure about this because I'm fairly sure Elvira didn't see anything all movie. I'm not even sure we saw any evidence that Elvira was evil. Fuck. Right now I'm thinking that Sharon Stone's just angry that there's a woman in the film with no reason to be totally embarrassed. <laughs> So his army is defeated, everyone on his side has either run off or died, and Egon decides not to walk off and try to find the next ridiculously stupid city he can convert to lion worshipping gold slaves, but instead tries to kill everyone himself. His plan could only make sense if he thought he'd turn into Michael Jackson in Moonwalker. And that's not the best plan ever. So they find Shwarma and dunk him in the pond because, heh, that's enough punishment for trying to get everyone killed. Not a nice thing to do to a holy man. This is bad comedy. And that's that, Alan Quartermain and the Lost City of Gold. Fuck, this was terrible. The first is silly and ridiculous and racist, but at least it was entertaining and usually pretty funny. This is just ridiculous and racist. This had exactly three good parts. James Earl Jones, Quartermain's reaction to the guy headbutting a rock, and Henry Silva's laugh. I'm almost sorry that there wasn't a third one, just so I could see how much shitter it could have got. <sighs> I'm the Amanda Hagen, and I have to live with that every day. Have you ever made love? Never. I'm pure. But once when I was a child, I saw my mother. It was shameful, and I'll never forget it. I could live with angels.